Warning, the content on this podcast is both highly adult and potentially enlightening. Please do not listen if you're not, I don't know, emotionally 25, physically 18. Thank you. We're back. It's Orgy Story, a narrative-based podcast about hosting, attending, and destigmatizing orgies. I'm your host, Kevin. Co-hosts, we're all here today. Hannah's here. Vicky's here. We just interviewed Rachel Kramer, Bustle. How y'all feel about that? This is amazing. She's a editor, writer, experienced in telling erotic sex stories. Yeah, it was so great to talk to her. Um, theme of the theme of the episode: erotica is everywhere. Erotica is every the grocery store at the aquarium. It's absolutely everywhere. We're gonna get some orgy stuff in there as well. Don't worry. Under the sea, in in space, in spe- Mars. In Mars, I, that was there's uh, orgy on Mars. I felt like is a nice. 90s movie we could have absolutely made that might be a little more difficult now, but we are hard at work on season two and we thought we would offer a little amuse-bouche. Just a quick check-in before we unleash. And talk about some great ideas that we now have for our future orgies. What an inspirational interview. Seriously. We'll see y'all more around orgy season. You know the dates. All right. Welcome to Orgy Story. Rachel, we are stoked to have you on. You are one of the guests that we continue to kind of figure out why are you slumming it with us on Orgy Story, but we're (laughs) glad you are. How is your march starting? Thank you. My march is starting very nicely. uh, I live in New Jersey and it's been cold, but today was sunny. So I went outside, which was very nice. Yeah, we're out here in Denver, so we could definitely relate. But we are talking to Rachel Kramer Bustle, author of well, so this is kind of a mouthful. You have written a lot of <laughs> a lot of things. You are working on several anthologies. I believe it's sixty plus. We're gonna just hit the highlights, including the one you just published. It feels like Valentine's Day. Was that the? It, it came out in December, but it uh, kind of December to February ish or probably the high moments for erotica. But any time of the year is a great time to. You know, read erotica, in my opinion. I like that opinion, too. <laughs> we'll ask you about orgy season later, because we have like a, we think it's a warm weather thing. But the book is the best women's erotica of the year. This is, this is volume five. It has mermaids. It has gangbangs. It has our interest. Our first question, we get a lot of, why are you talking about sex? Why are you revealing this? Why get so personal? We're curious, your response, you've been doing this a long time. Um, volumes one through four as well. Why sex? Why this topic? Why sex? Uh, I just think it's fun, first of all. And I think people are always curious about other people's sex lives, whether in, you know, nonfiction, fiction, porn, video, recording themselves, whatever, like, I and, and just telling stories. I just think it's kind of natural human curiosity. And I think even if you've done a lot of sexual things, like, let's say, I don't know, I'm not going to Give it, give an exact, you know, this, you know, slept with this you many could people. Say done it, this many and things, we've but... probably done it, so you're fine. <laughs> right. But like, no matter what you've done, even if you're super sexually experienced, let's say there's probably some things you haven't done, whether just because you haven't gotten around to them yet, or you haven't had the opportunity, or, you know, there's things that your body cannot do, or things like, you know, mermaid sex, alien sex. I, I highly doubt those things are going to happen, but may, maybe in some other universe they are, in, you know, in real life. But Alien um, sex is a different podcast. It has a lot there. It's a topic, the alien sex. But yeah, we, we've yet to see it uh, proofed out. But absolutely. So I think there's just always going to be things that people want to know more about, whether it relates to their personal life or more as a kind of voyeuristic thing or more just because it's interesting. Um, so and it's funny because I've always said I'll stop writing and editing erotica when it gets boring for me, but it's been 21 years now and it's not boring yet. So I think there's just always people coming up with new ways to talk about sex or new ways to tell a story. And I'm always interested in finding those stories that sound new to me after doing this for such a long time. Yeah. And that curiosity is just so high for wanting to learn more and read more and do more. 
And I, I think like that feeling of being really excited to write your first erotica story or, or your second or third or hundredth, but like often like the first or the early ones, people bring to it such energy. Like they're so excited to be writing these stories and sharing them and finding out what people think. And that is what to me keeps erotica as a genre alive and also just keeps me interested in it. It, it always feels a little new, even though I've been doing it for a while because I'm working with different authors and I'm seeing different points of view and they're writing about things like sex in a, in an aerialist performance, which I, I don't even totally understand how that works. <laughs> and I, I've, I've read the story several times and I've thought about it, but like, there's just mechanics of that where I'm like, wow, that is so creative and interesting. And I would love to see that in real life, you know? <laughs> Well, and clearly you have an extremely vivid imagination. That's that comes comes through for sure. How often do you? I, I kind of picture you sitting around most a lot of a lot of your days and dedicating quote unquote work to just imagining uh, imagining up these erotica novels. How often do you sit around imagining imagining s- sex and sexy stories and uh, ideas for your for your novels? Well, I think. I don't write as often as I used to. When I first started doing this, I was writing a lot of stories and now I'm more editing other people's stories, but I do get a lot of ideas. I don't always write them all out fully, but I get ideas all the time, like at the grocery store or when I'm traveling, especially because I think after you get over the initial, like, okay, I made it to my flight or my bus, like there's so much good people watching that you can do and I love to just sort of look at people and imagine, you know, what, what, what their sex life is like, what their fantasies are based on, you know, the limited clues that I have. Uh, and some, or sometimes I'm, I, sometimes I eavesdrop, I admit that, but also sometimes I just overhear things and I'm like, wow, that is fascinating. And then I think if you're looking at the world through an erotic lens, you will find potential erotica story ideas everywhere. I do that often too, especially if I see a couple fighting in public. All I'm thinking is their makeup sex is going to be amazing. I I love that. Viewing the world with an erotic lens. I just, I can't get over the grocery store moment because I kind of picture you've got your notepad and you're like, make a note to self. Vegetables can be super hot. And the person next to you is just like, okay. I mean, it's not, it's not every time, but I think if you're focused on that, or if you're just kind of in that mindset, like if you're writing in the middle of writing erotica and then you have to go to the grocery store, things are going to occur to you. And they're not always the obvious things. I mean, it's not always like, Oh, that phallic cucumber. Like it could be, I I don't know, like someone buying some other item that you wouldn't nor that you wouldn't normally think of as sexy, but in the context of whatever's happening, uh, it, it becomes sexy. So like in the next volume of Best Woman's Erotica, there's a story about a vegetarian woman who lusts after this butcher. And I think food especially, there's, there's just so many erotic elements to buying it, eating it, preparing it, like serving it to someone, um, you know, just this, it, it hits on all the senses and just so many attachments to food. So I don't know, I think you can find er- erotica inspiration really anywhere, even in you know, on the news, when you're reading about really bleak things, people, those people are probably still having sex. I mean, maybe not in the middle of whatever, you know, running a country, but, um, you know, there, there's a story in my book about a woman president and, you know, it's not necessarily about having sex on the job, but, you know, like our sex lives and the rest of our lives are not always totally separate. Like I think most people have probably thought about sex at their job at some point. And I think when you're bringing sexuality into places and spaces where, you know, it's taboo on some level, like you're not supposed to for various reasons, that can be also super hot. Absolutely. I will say one warning to the audience. I got the audio book and immediately I'm in an air, I was in an airplane listening to it, which I definitely suggest if you're headed on like an erotic adventure with a partner, but if you're just there alone, you're going to get some strange <laughs> looks because I think people could just tell on my face. And I did find myself going into some some different locations as I was thinking about it because it's just like 
not usually into the mile high thing, but all of a sudden I find myself, it's like, where are the mermaids? Where's the single mermaids you can catch on? But the funny thing about that too is, um, to your point, Rachel, it's a refreshing perspective to just admit that most people are thinking about sex a lot more often than they than they either like to admit or do admit and so it's a refreshing perspective to just admit why don't let's 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 talk about it let's think about it let's imagine it yeah especially the taboo aspect too because you tend to think oh this is wrong this is wrong but when you realize everyone's kind of thinking you know about all the wrong taboo things it's nice and refreshing Uh, to see deviance Uh is fun I mean, everyone's done it. And now I am not advocating like, you know, bailing on your job and, you know, sexting <laughs> all day. I, I think the thing that makes it hot, too, is that, you know, you're, you're kind of sneaking it in. Um, and, you know, maybe one person is at home and one person's at their office and they're trying to have phone sex. But obviously, most likely the person at the office, unless they have their own private office, like can't be as open about what they're saying or doing. So, you know, I think there's there's all sorts of ways that both in real life, sexuality kind of jumps into places that aren't like the typical bedroom or wherever, but also, especially in erotica, you can play with that and have fun with it and take it kind of to an over the top exaggerated version of it. And you've purposefully for volume five, it seems like we're looking for sort of a a fantasy, sort of a fantasy style. It looked like the calls were looking for stories that had kind of a next generation feel Can you talk to us a little bit about how you choose that? Like, what are the stories? Why these stories that you're highlighting? Um, We love the feminist perspective because you really highlight voices that we need to hear. How do you make those decisions? So in some ways it's easy and in some ways it's really challenging because what I start with is like a blank page and an idea. In this case, I said I want outrageous stories. Uh, And I, I picked a theme I try to pick a theme that's a little bit varied, but not so specific unless I'm editing a book about bondage or spanking. And those are about those specific topics. But in, in the case of outrageous, I, I wanted them to be outrageous, but I also wanted people to be surprised. I didn't want every story to be, oh, this again, you know, because because I think then the concept of outrageous, I think readers get bored. And the whole point to me of an anthology is to give variety. So, you know, I don't necessarily expect every person to love every story equally because they're all, you know, different. There's, there's like, like I said, the president having sex and that's actually a very tender, almost romantic story. And then there's like sex in a cupcake bakery and like dancing in front of an audience naked and various, various other takes on that. So I put out that, call to the public and I'll say, send me stories about this topic. And I try to give instructions that are somewhat detailed, but that leave room for the plot to be really anything that could touch on what's outrageous. And I wanted people to think about not just what's sort of sounds totally over the top, which some of these stories are, but also what's what's outrageous to you might be different than what's outrageous to me might be different to what's outrageous to, you know, person at A, B, or C who might be different, you know, have come to it from different perspectives. And I think we can't assume that, you know, there's some universal outrageousness. So I really wanted to give readers just a variety of, of perspectives. And I think the stories that I picked do that. And, the, and they are all coming from, different um, types of characters. I mean, there's two women who have an, have a fling in 1669. Obviously what's outrageous to them is going to be probably different than what's outrageous to, you know, someone in 2020. Uh, so, and, but, you know, I could tell you like the things I look for, but it's always kind of that. I know it when I see it. Um, and it's also about balancing you know, okay, I have a story about, uh, I don't know, I don't have a hard and, hard and fast rules about, okay, I have this ma- ma- this many people of this sexuality or this many, you know, threesomes or this many, you know, this many people. I, I don't have rules like, okay, one You don't threesome, have like an outline that says, no. yeah, must have like group. Check boxes. Yeah. But, it, so, but it's more about sort of the tone 
and the variety of that. I don't want them all to be first person. I don't want them all to be straight women. I don't want them all to be white. Like, I don't want it all to sound the same. I want the, the types of people that are the types of characters and the way they tell their stories and their personalities to be different. And I'm always looking for a variety of also like single people and people in relationships. Cause I think writer erotic writers have a tendency to write about single people, you know, meeting someone and there's this inherent drama to it and then they hook up and there's nothing wrong with that. Like that makes for a great erotica too, but I'm always interested in, both couples and people in other types of relationships, what it, what's erotic to them? What what happens after those people have hooked up and then it's, you know, 5, 10, 20 or more years later, what is outrageous to, to that couple or that, you know, dynamic? So uh, so I look for that. Um, and yeah. do you include people? What's the, because obviously you're talking to writers, you've been in this world now a while, so I'd imagine it's a little easier to get content for volume five than maybe volume one, two, but do you include others, bounce it off them? Is it a, is it sort of just a one woman show or what's the, I what, because you have editors, obviously. The, I do the, the putting together of the initial book myself, like I'll take all the stories that come in, which is usually a couple hundred and then I'll winnow it down. Sometimes one might not work for a certain book because there's already something like it there or for another reason, but I really like the story. So I might say to that author, I really like the story. Could I use it in the next volume or in another book? And so I'll take that set of 20 or so stories and turn it into my publisher. And then they'll say, usually they'll say, okay, these stories are good. Sometimes there's they might have an issue with something in a story, whether um, I had a story about a rape fantasy that they felt was a little too, too sure. edgy. So, but I work with that author and I said, you know, they, they couldn't use this story, but do you have anything else that might work? I try to, you know, be fair to the authors rather than just say, okay, that didn't work. It's rejected. Um, and that's important but- to probably note. You don't just get carte blanche on some of this. I know the material already seems extreme, but we were just at a, a, a sex conference where we were listening to a whole thing about consensual non-consent or sort of those rape fantasies done in a more safe environment. And it's still illegal in places. So it is absolutely I would imagine you do have to kind of walk a fine line, especially when you're trying to say outrageous stories. Right. Yeah. And even, you know, there's a story in this book that some readers have found problematic around consent. I didn't. So uh, otherwise I wouldn't have published it. And I do understand the nuances. There's just the story I was talking about frosting where uh, two women are having sex in a cupcake bakery. Now I, uh, their actions are consensual with each other, but then there's also the staffers. And, you know, in my opinion, there's sort of an implied consent that the staffers are open to it into it. Um, I, you know, I think that is open to interpretation and that that kind of feedback is something I keep in mind for the future and I kind of look out for, but I, I do think that's important. That's not necessarily a rule that was handed down to me, but just my own ethical take on putting erotica out in the world. I don't necessarily think every action should feel like, uh, it, it is totally plausible in the real world because there is a fantasy, element to it. But I do take issues of consent and safety seriously. Like I wouldn't have someone just leave someone tied up and, you know, leave the house for at all really, or, or, you know, just leave them alone. This is an orgy story show recommendation. If you find yourself with a little extra time, check out Naked Attraction. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. It's a British dating show where they reveal nudity first. It's referenced on this podcast. You might find some enjoyment out of it. It's very cheeky. Back to the show. So I'm interested in this, uh, the and to hear your take on some of the feedback you've gotten from listeners, from other authors that you work with. Have you noticed any themes in terms of what people are requesting from you that they really want to hear about that they really want you to write about um tell us about about your interpretation of what you've uh been what has been requested of you 
you know, I wish people made more requests of me as readers <laughs> because that you asked like how I pick the stories. I mean, I try to pick stories that I think readers will enjoy, but that's challenging because, you know, every, everyone's coming to it from such different perspectives. And I think people read erotica so personally, you know, they're bringing their own sexual interests and desires to it. And, and I think one thing I do try to do in, in light of, you know, I, I do get feedback in terms of reviews and a lot of them, you know, I'll see, okay, a lot of people like the story that's about, uh, let's, this is hypothetical. I don't know. Like if, if a lot of people, the gang like, bang, oh, oh, I love, yes. <laughs> if, 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 ever, if like all the feedback was like more gang bangs, then I would put more gang bangs in. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily not put more gang bangs in if, if they didn't say that, but, um, I, I do look for the ones that really stand out for readers and try to provide more of that for future books. Uh, let's but be I, on. I, Let- I, I'd love more, more requests. <laughs> Let's be honest. I was hoping you were going to say our listeners or our, our readers or my readers love orgies. <laughs> yeah, we are this for selfish reasons. I, I, I love orgies. I mean, that's what I was saying before. Like, I, I, I'm not saying I get bored by just, you know, reading like two people hooking up. But I think there's only so many things that can happen. I mean, a lot can happen between two people, but a lot more, you know, can happen when you add more people. There's more just physical action, more you know, just drama. So, um, and I think, I think the reason I don't get as many stories sent to me about group sex and orgies, I think partly because it is more challenging to write, right? Because there's just more people's perspectives to more characters to be share. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's the kind of thing that I think sometimes people don't always know, like, enough to say you guys do right so you're like yes more orgies um I I feel like sometimes when people read erotica they don't always know what they're looking for but then they're like oh that was really interesting like I want to read more about that um so it's like after the fact then they realize oh I I I do want to read no more um and I think that's something I try to offer people like I think like I said earlier like I do spanking and bondage books now Oh, can I plug one of them? Here we go. Girls and cheeky spanking stories. Oh, fast girls and cheeky spanking stories. I love the cheeky. We were just watching the show Sexual Attraction, the British show where they reveal naked your naked attraction. Naked attraction. Your genitals first, and that's sort of the, they use cheeky all the time. We got a good. It's like <laughs> I, so, like, and and I think those books are great. I love them. Like, I I have an interest in spanking and bondage, but. I think only someone who's predisposed to say, oh, I'm into spanking is going to pick up a book of spanking erotica. But I think, like, let's say that's 100 people. I'm sure it's more than 100, but let's just say. But I'm sure there's, like, a 1,000 people who would enjoy a story, an individual story or more about spanking, but they don't know it yet. But when they, they get sucked in and they start reading, they're like, oh, I really enjoyed that. Maybe I want to know more about that. And I think the same likely goes for for orgies. But um, so I try to kind of offer a lot of different things in one book. And then if people want to know more, they can read more. Or in the case of Joanna Angel, they can watch more. There, actually, that was something we you get a variety of people submitting these stories. And we are curious from from seems like porn stars to just performers to femme writers. There's just a fantastic um, mix, but it does let you follow up on some of them, which actually I was going to ask how the live story went. Cause you all did a, an anthology reading. This was a Valentine's party and this is the type of Valentine's party. I strongly encourage people to go to. <laughs> this is a date people can get behind, but it sounds like you all did sort of a live reading where the, the narrators or the authors of the story were with you and talking about it. What's that like? Cause it's one thing to be, you know, I, I, on Amazon, people can buy your books, but when you're staring at them, it's a little different. It is definitely different. I think it humanizes the authors and it kind of, I think it humanizes everyone because we're all there for the same purpose. And a friend asked me the other day, like, is it awkward? Is it weird to be reading these dirty words when you're live and people are, you know, staring right at you? And at the beginning it was, and sometimes it still is, but 
I, I think I'm also focused on just telling the story and, and giving them something different that they're not getting necessarily from just reading it themselves. And I think that's what the authors bring to it as well. They can give a little backstory. They can really make it funnier or sexier, or just amplify what's already on the page. And when Joanna Angel read, first of all, I was sitting next to her and she was like crossing out all sorts of things like to, to tell it. She, she didn't have time to read the whole story, but it looked like she was like editing it and just savaging it. Like there were, there was just a lot of marks all over the page. But then when she told it, it sounded so natural. Like she was just telling a story from her life. Uh, and her story is called One Last Gang Bang, which spoiler alert, it was not the last. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is the story I've been in tune with for uh, the better part of about 41 minutes of live audio. And as you're doing these, is that the goal? Do you pump in a lot of live shows? Is that something sort of new? Because after 21 years, we're kind of curious what's changed the most about writing erotica. And to me, there, it's the audience. It's the fact that people would go to a book store and listen to it. It's interesting because I actually think erotica is harder to find at bookstores now than it was 20 years ago. Because back then, there were bookstores. This was in New York, so... New York City, so I don't know if this was like this everywhere, but I would go into uh, Borders, which no longer exists, but... Shout out to Borders. Like, Great job. Like, you know, bookstores like that, like mainstream bookstores, and there would be erotica and not necessarily hidden away, like sort of up front, like that's how I discovered a lot of it. Um, so, uh, and, and smaller bookstores. And now I think it's much harder to find. Sometimes it's in romance. Sometimes it's in sexuality. I go into tons of bookstores that have maybe the story of O or maybe Fifty Shades of Grey, and that's it. Like, they don't have an erotica section. And it always baffles me because I'm pretty sure people would buy it, but I don't know if they're just prudish or what. So to me, when I do events at bookstores, it's really important because aside from, you know, entertaining people, I think it's just showing people whether they actually attend the event or not, but people who come into the bookstore and see, okay, like you have this political book and this memoir and then, oh, erotica that A, erotica is out there and it exists and it's, you know, happening and that people can be interested in it and not be creepy about it. Like people come to a bookstore event and it, it's a reading. Like I think sometimes people think, oh, it's literally an orgy at a bookstore. And I'm like, no, I mean, maybe afterwards people can. Go I think do people want that. Want. I think people just hope it's that because we get a lot of feedback similar. That's like, hey, how do we get invited to like, calm down? <laughs> like <laughs> People I have the run... same assumptions about us, but they would be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> like I used to run a reading series at a bar in New York and sometimes I would invite authors and they would be skittish about it because, you know, they thought it was more than a reading series. I'm like, no, literally it's a reading event. There's, you know, it's a bar, there's alcohol, there's food, but, um, you know, we're, we're reading stories. We're not getting naked because it's not that kind of party. And I'm not saying there's, that those kinds of parties are awesome too, but I think it's also important to have public spaces where you can talk about sex in public in an open, honest way, or in this case, erotica fiction. And it's okay. Like you can say these words and no one's going to like die. Like nothing bad is going to happen. Um, you're, you're just sharing these stories and then, you know, on your own, you can discuss them further or, you know, I'm sure I, I, I mean, couples come, Couples, pe people in relationships come to my events. I'm sure, I, I assume they're going home and having sex afterwards. But, um, you know, I think it's nice to have these public spaces where you know, sex isn't this taboo thing, where it's not off limit. It kind of demystifies everything, too. And it would be fantastic to hear some. Do you get feedback from couples that are like, I've had a mermaid fantasy, the costume, I just never pulled the trigger, but now I have? Do you get that sort of. I, I sometimes do. I hear a lot from people who are reading it with a partner and then, you know, talking about what they read together or, you know, what they would want to do, either based on the story or just inspired by it. I think it's a really great way for people to talk about things or start those conversations when they're not sure how to start those conversations, because you can, instead of saying, okay, like I want to try bondage, let's do X, Y, and Z. You can say, Hey, let's read this story about it. And then you, you're not necessarily putting pressure on the other person to have an, a response right away. They can 
you know, think about it. And also, I think the way you're telling a story in fiction is different than it is in nonfiction. So, so there's just more room for imagination and putting yourself into some part of the story. Yeah. And with us, one of our biggest takeaways from all of this, which is going to circle back to what we're going to ask you as we, we kind of round third here, we could ask you, we've got about 75 questions that we haven't gotten to yet. (laughs) So we, We'll certainly be circling back to chat with you, but we we really wanted to get you on as fast as possible, and we cannot keep Rachel all day. We're going to get some feedback that's like, WTF? (laughs) But (laughs) as we get into this, our our big goal has been to try and share in community some of the things that we felt like we had really been not necessarily shamed about, but shamed about in some ways. And I think in 2020, one of the things that we love is that you can be a sexual person and a serious person and a professional person, maybe more so than you could when you even started this. Have you noticed any changes in just the industry in terms of that regard, the the sort of out loud feminism that, that comes with the last five years? Do you feel similarly or is it sim- like you said with the literature, it's, it's almost worse. We're, we're curious your take. I think it's better in that people can wrap their heads around the idea that there's people who sexuality is part of their profession. And, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, hit on them or act weird around them, but it does mean that hopefully they're open-minded about sex. And then I think just, just by existing, just by, you know, having a, a presence online and, obviously in the real world, I think that really just gives people a feeling of, okay, it's okay to be whatever, whatever you are. And one of my favorite stories about this is I was at lunch with my mom and this friend of hers who I'd known my whole life. um, I was like in my twenties, I think. And my mom went, went to the bathroom and she said, quick, before she gets back, I just wanted to tell you that I was on your website and you, you guys like this. I was looking for information about sex parties. And, um, you know, she was like, do you know, you know, she was like asking me about it. And it was really interesting to me because she felt open enough to share that with me, which I didn't know about her. Um, you know, and I think that was because obviously she knew that I wouldn't be judging her. And I think we really need more spaces and people and community like that because, you know, you can't, like we were saying before, you know, there's erotic uh, potential everywhere, but there's also just, you know, everyone around you, you don't know what their sex life is like or what their fantasies are like just by looking at them. And they may have desires that they don't feel like they can act on or even really reckon with in their own mind because of their own shame and our, our cultures, you know, this this idea that yes, we, I think things are more open, but there's still a lot of taboos. I, I work with authors who can't like uh, the page for the book that they're in on Facebook, because if they did that with their real name, their neighbors would see it and their community would see it and like shame them about it. So um, well, we kind of think- go through a little bit like that, talking about our podcast to family and friends, we still kind of face a stigma or some shame and everything going, going forward with that. So it's and, good. Yeah. I don't think anyone is should be under pressure to like be out about anything that they don't want to be out about. But I do hope that we are moving towards a world where more people can access that information and just feel comfortable at the very least in their own minds about the things that they're interested in and certainly about, you know, the things they want to explore. Cause I think that shame like lingers and then it, it, can become a problem for that person. And then if they're in a relationship with someone, but they don't feel comfortable talking about the things they're interested in, I think, it, you know, if, if you can't talk about it, then you can't, you know, even you're never going to get to the part about doing something about it. Absolutely. And the processing side gets a little, you, you just don't want to repress that too much. It has been our experience, but that's again, probably a different podcast because none of us currently are psychologists on this end. We do have some things you've also inspired, so we're just going to give you some compliments because immediately we were like, oh, we got to raise our game with these orgy stories. We don't have any <laughs> orgy stories on Mars. We have nothing about inner space stuff galactically. And frankly, water is usually not as friendly to the orgy scene, so you've at mm. least given us a nice challenge as we move into season two. And definitely two. some orgy theme ideas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, you if you are inspired to write any erotica, you should send it to me. We'll keep you posted because we will always we'll do the the team up because we saw the big books of big book of orgasms you've written. Come again, sex toy erotica, which is a passionate topic of ours. Uh, at our first orgy, we brought sex toys, and everyone looked at us like we were crazy. We're like, "What are you talking about? Like, we're we're about to enjoy ourselves." And now that seems like a weird space to be to be getting those kinds of reactions. It wasn't negative. It was just these people are serious. It was yeah, <laughs> they more came of a confused play. reaction. I think. Anna, why the hell didn't we bring toys? Sort of. Oh, that why, kinda... why don't we think of that? Yeah. But they admired you. We we like to think so. That's how we've we've spun it in our heads and. Orgies in general, much like w- with yours, once we started to enter into this world and started studying it, it was just, holy shit, there's so many topics. There's BDSM orgies, there's swinger orgies, there's non-play types of events, there's cruises, there's same sex, there's bathhouse. So we've just uh, really run into a kind of crazy smorgasbord. So this will be as we round and finally let you get back to your Sunday how do you pick specific topics with such a vast world? Is there ever a time that you really set out and say, I have to get this one, or is it really just the story speaks to you? Usually it's the story speaks to me, but sometimes I'll say to myself, okay, I really want a a story about this. Like right now I'm editing an anthology about women's orgasms. And there are topics that I want to hit on. I I haven't read all the submissions that have come in, so I don't know if people have, but like, if I don't get a story that's about, or, you know, explores like G spot play, I'm going to seek that out either saying, Hey, does anyone have a story about G spot play? Or I might email some authors that I've worked with before and say, Hey, do you, could you write me something about this? Uh, Like, you know, sometimes I'll have, not, I don't know if it, I'd call it a checklist, but a highlights reel that I want to to get to. But usually, just through the process of looking through the the t- stories that people have written, I, I I'll find the balance and variety that I'm I'm looking for. But sometimes I also get ideas for future books based on what people send me. So if if like suddenly I got you know, 20 stories about mermaids, I I think to myself, okay, wow, like mermaids are even more popular than I thought they were. I should do a whole book of mermaid around. Or the cupcake shop, because that one's got me. I know, I've been intrigued by bakery sex now. (laughs) You've you've swerved into two of our favorite lanes, food and sex. (laughs) The book is Best Women's Erotica of the Year, Volume 5. The woman mastermind behind it is Rachel Kramer Bustle. You can find her all over the interwebs. Um, we were having a good time doing some web research this morning because <laughs> you could dabble from a crazy amount of erotica to some interesting pieces about hoarding. So yes. you are all over the place, and we cannot thank you enough for coming on to talk to us about, about the new book. Thank you for having me. Any other places we can send people? Rockalita on Twitter, eroticawriting101.com, or have I hit all the uh, the main ones? Those are the main ones. And if you want to find more about the series, you can go to bweoftheyear.com, and there's a call for writing, and there's information about the first five volumes, and uh, and you can also follow us on Instagram at Best Women's Erotica. Excellent. Rachel, thank you so much thank for being you on the so show. Much, thank Rachel. You. It was thank a blast you. talking to you. That was Rachel Kramer Bustle. She's fantastic. Fun to hear the erotica side. I always like the story stuff too. And so many more questions we wanted to ask, but just couldn't keep her with us all day. We do have to be respectful of people's times. So that's that's <laughs> the one sad part. Until we get to HBO, we can just do eight hours of a documentary. <laughs> They've got nothing but airtime and if you know anyone at hbo if you just please mention (laughs) follow us on instagram hannah what's it's at orgy story shoot us a follow tell a friend you know you want to and shoot us an email at orgystorycast at gmail.com we want to hear your stories we want to know what you want to hear from us we are deep in planning orgies for orgy season and season two so tell us what you think we should be uh looking into come on everyone this is the time where we're our inspiration is at its finest. We, uh, we're very open to your ideas. It's almost warm out. The seasons are changing. It's almost orgy time. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>